Good afternoon. My name is Paula Van Gilder. Talk with Paula in PA's way. Our mission, stop the stigma, spread awareness with mental health and addiction through speaking up, speaking out with integrity and love. Acknowledge it's okay not to be okay and you're not alone. As we are moving into the months and darker days, join me here on Talk with Paula in November as we will have a few holistic practitioners and friends for yoga, meditation, and we'll be giving live presentations to shed some love and light. Today's guest is Ryan Palmer, candidate for Windsor County Sheriff. First and foremost, congratulations on your primary victory, Ryan, and welcome. Thank you so much, Paul. I appreciate it. And thank you for having me back. I, the first time we did this was uh, amazing and yeah. I got a lot of good feedback. So, and also thank you to all the voters out there that supported me throughout the primary process, right? It was a big win in August that's propelling us a lot of forward momentum into mm -hmm. the uh, general election, November 8th. I am a resident of Windsor. I've been a law enforcement officer most of my life. Basically, I started at 19 years old. Uh, I've had some forays into the public sector, uh, or excuse me, the private sector a little bit. But uh, I'm the chair of the Windsor Select Board. Been doing that now I'm two years into the, my term with the Windsor Select Board. Again, law enforcement officer for a long time, veteran of both Iraq and Afghanistan, many, many, many trainings and, and uh, certifications uh, on the law enforcement field. So FBI crisis negotiator, school resource officer, firearms use of force instructor, uh, de-escalation training, all these different things that uh, I think have made me a very well-rounded police mm. officer. Um, business owner, I've owned so many own businesses along the way and those type of things. So I think a very well-rounded candidate, uh, you know, grown up in Windsor, went away a couple different times, but I'm back in Windsor and Windsor County is my home. I love it here. Well, welcome and thank you for joining yes, me. You did answer a few things, but I'm going to still elaborate on a few. Um, sure. Tell me a little bit about yourself. I know you just did, but even yeah, a little bit more. So, Again, grew up in Windsor. Most of my family's in the area. Played sports at Windsor High School. Went to Windsor High School. Uh, left, went to Hesser College for a little bit. Ended up joining the Air Force Reserve, which I deployed to Iraq uh, in 2008, 2009. Switched units to the Connecticut Air National Guard. I deployed to Afghanistan 11 and to 12 with them. Spent 10 years uh, between the two service of the, the Air Force. Started in police work in Claremont at 19 years old back in 06. So been doing it for, for a while. I've also worked for that in the Department of Corrections in Vermont. And had some different forays into the business world. Had my own business in Windsor for a while. I also, you know, have a little DJ business on the side that I've been doing that since I was 12 years old. So uh, I like to keep some things outside of law enforcement. You know, it makes you a more well-rounded person. And in, I've had my eye on this race for a long time, but I think in February I announced my candidacy as the Democrat, you know, in the Democrat primary, uh, won the Democratic nomination in August. And now we're pressing forward for the general election November 8th that you can vote on or before November 8th with everybody now in the state should have a mail-in ballot. So remember to either use your mail-in ballot or bring it with you to the polls on November 8th because uh, they're going to want to see that or you're going to have to sign an affidavit that you hadn't voted already. I just want to throw that out there because it's going to be a little bit of a, a new process for folks, but I think it's, it's going to go smooth. Nice. What is your law enforcement background? Sure. So I started in law enforcement kind of back when I was still in high school in a way. A uh, neighbor of mine who was a police officer who I looked up to. I was DJing a high school dance. I said, hey, can I go on a ride along with you sometime? And I was hooked ever since. So at 16 years old, I was very much involved in the Windsor Police Department doing ride alongs every time I could. I mean, almost like I was a full-time employee, it felt like, so I probably drove some of those guys nuts, <laughs> but spent a lot of time in a cruiser then. Went away to college 
for a semester and then joined the Air Force, came back, got hired, Vermont Department of Corrections, worked there for a little bit before I was hired at the Claremont, New Hampshire Police Department. Bounced around a little bit since then. Most of my time was spent in Windsor, about nine years. I've been at Ludlow Police Department for five years now. Roles, everything from kind of de facto school resource officer, I'm a certified school resource officer through NASRO, which is a, the largest school resource accreditation body in the country, so basic and an advanced school resource officer there. Uh, I've worked as a detective. I do SIU investigations here in Ludlow, which are serious child abuse or sexual assault cases. I deal with those. Uh, I've worked some pretty high-level drug interdiction stuff uh, in Windsor, a couple, couple pretty big cases. We've done, done many, uh, not many, we did some very significant cases in Ludlow where we took a lot of drugs off the street and, and pretty big time drug dealers. So everything from run of the mill, dealing with a barking dog to assisting, I mean, we've had been involved in a couple different homicide investigations, not that I was primary investigator, but, but involved in those cases. So really runs the gamut, right? Um, a lot of experience from the law enforcement side uh, on, in that aspect of it. What made you decide to run for the position of Windsor County Sheriff? And that's a question that, one, I love it because I think you should know a candidate's why. Mm -hmm. and it's a question that I get a lot. And for me, it's to change rural law enforcement in Windsor County, to improve it. When I hear stories of folks across the state that say, hey, I live in a place that doesn't have full-time police, and with staffing shortages and all these things going on in the world, when you come home and your house is broken into and you get told, mm, call your insurance company, we'll take a report over the phone, or, hey, there's a, a drug dealer or a, a drug house in our town that no one's doing anything about, uh, we have this issue or that issue, and, and we don't have <coughs> full-time police to help us with this. So for me, it's providing modern professional law enforcement service to folks outside of our larger towns that can't afford full-time police work. So changing from what I call a policing for profit model, which mm -hmm. is kind of how the Sheriff's Department operates now, uh, to something that resembles much more of the, the hometown community policing that I think we all could appreciate. Yep, absolutely. Um, what would you say the Sheriff's position entails? Well, statutorily, the Sheriff is obligated to do a couple things the service of civil process. What that means is you're serving basically court paperwork, whether it's divorce papers, subpoenas, uh, evictions is a big part of what the sheriffs do. Um, and then there's the law enforcement aspect of it, right? Where the sheriff is a law enforcement officer, his deputies are law enforcement officers. And they can contract their law enforcement services out to places like, in this area, Bridgewater or Plymouth that are too small to have their own police department, but they can contract their services out. So those are kind of the three aspects that you see in the Sheriff's Department. Prisoner transports, mental health watches, if somebody's stuck in a hospital, an ER. I mean, it's a whole other mm -hmm. conversation about the, the mental health system in our state. But oftentimes folks get dumped in an ER and, and sometimes the sheriffs will watch, will kind of supervise them, guard them, or the service of civil process, which again is that paperwork service thing. But the third part is the law enforcement contracts, where they're either providing law enforcement service or they're doing things like wide load escorts, construction details, those type of things. What are your goals um, for the Windsor County Sheriff Department? So to touch on my goals first, or before we touch on my goals, I want to kind of give some background of how it operates now. Okay. And that will make more sense when we talk about my goals. Currently, the Sheriff's Department has about 18 folks on the roster. They provide contractual law enforcement in about nine towns across the county, most of which is just speed enforcement. They sit on a main thoroughfare and write tickets to everybody going through. In Vermont, up until I believe this year or last year, 87.5% of the ticket went back to the town. 
now it's cut down to closer to 60%, I think, or 50-something percent. But the majority of the ticket revenue went back to the towns. So what was happening is the sheriffs would offer, hey, we'll be your law enforcement service, which has been primarily traffic enforcement, but we'll write enough tickets to either pay for ourselves or come close to paying for ourselves, ignoring everything else that's going on from a criminal justice standpoint, right? Uh, and that's always bothered me about the way the sheriff's department operates. And then it always goes back, oh, we need the revenue, we need the revenue, we don't have a, we don't have a, a real budget, so we have to do these contracts. And for me, it's about shifting the scope of the contract to providing modern professional law enforcement service, community policing, working on reducing harm, tackling crime. We've all seen this rise in violent crime in Vermont, let alone the drug epidemic that's been going on. And now it's no longer in, we're using the term opiate epidemic because it, for the last yeah. 10 years, it's it, primarily been opiates. But what we're seeing now is this influx of methamphetamine, oh, yeah. crack cocaine, some what we call bath salts, but, but we're seeing a lot more methamphetamine mm -hmm. and crack cocaine. And what's worrisome about that is people on stimulants are much more violent and unpredictable than people on opiates. Yeah. Yes, the opiates will kill you, but the stimulants uh, cause a whole other mm. list of problems. So for me, it's, it's tackling the rise in crime and providing actual problem solving, right? Law enforcement is about problem solving mm -hmm. and helping people through their problems, which is not going on now. And I'll argue, anybody who wants to argue with me, uh, we, can, we can talk about that and I've got plenty of evidence to show that that's not what's going on, right? The doctrine, the ethos of the Sheriff's Department primarily, if not solely, focuses on the law enforcement side Traffic tickets, traffic tickets, traffic tickets. Don't get me wrong, you know, uh, public, you know, traffic enforcement is part of public safety, but, sh but it's not the only piece of public safety. So for me, it's, it's switching from this policing for profit model, right? Transitioning to community policing. You know, I want to ensure through training that we make sure that we're a bias free police department. You know, we've heard some, some, a lot of crazy things that happened in the news, you know, over the last several years and making sure that we are a bias-free police department. And I have this kind of three-prong approach where what I call at-risk youth engagement, right? Working with young kids, mm. primarily young kids that are deemed at-risk, which means there's a lot of stuff going on in their life that uh, isn't good, trying to put them on the right track. If we can change the trajectory of some of these young kids, before they're too far gone, yep. awesome. you know, that's, that's changing the world. And this idea that, that we're not doing that, that we're not involved in the communities, mm -hmm. that you have a countywide law enforcement agency that's sole focus is generating revenue through traffic enforcement, while you have this huge uptick in overdose deaths, you have a huge uptick in violent crime. I mean, we're seeing murders now yeah. Murders. Now, we've had a drug problem for a very, very long time in Vermont. But now it's like, wow. we're seeing the violence that's finally come with the drugs. Because yep. with, with narcotics trafficking, there's violence. It's just been slow to follow to Vermont. So now we're seeing that. So how do we combat that? So dealing with young kids at first, keeping them out of the system, whether it's formally or informally, school resource officer program, just stopping. If you go to my website, ryanforwindsor.com, you will see a picture of me playing football with kids on the playground. I love that one. Most of those kids are grown-ups now, yeah. you know, but that's my all-time favorite picture of me because it was a candid. I went out there and I enjoyed playing yep. football with the kids. And those are the things that we should be doing. So the second part is working much closer with our social service agencies, partners in that realm, to be that conduit to get people help when they're in distress, when they're in crisis, right? When's the best time to get somebody help? When they're at their lowest point. Mm -hmm. At least that's my, my opinion on that. So again, I, I use this word often when I talk about this, but we need to be the conduit. We should not just be a punitive body but we should be the, the folks that actually know where and have the connections and the networks and yep. the resources 
to direct people where they need to go and get help. Um, I've worked a lot, not worked a lot, but I've, I've communicated a lot with the folks here in Ludlow at the Divided Sky Foundation. I think that's going to be a great opportunity mm -hmm. for folks to get help um, working with those partner agencies. Um, I also have it in the works that I will be adding a victim's advocate slash social, work, social worker to the department. I think we can fit that in the current budget without asking for more money or trying to generate in the sheriff's department, you really have to generate your own revenue because it's a quasi business, I call it. Mm -hmm. um, there's some state and county funding, but it's very minimal compared to your total operating costs. But bring in that social worker to the department so you have that resource in-house whose sole focus is going to be getting people help and directing people in the right direction as well as training our officers better. And the third is, is proactive policing, proactive precision policing. And precision policing is kind of this loose term, but basically it means targeting criminals who are victimizing society and working on the causation of crime, right? And not worried so much about somebody who's running a little late to work. Not that that's not, again, I'm not dismissing right. that traffic safety, highway safety is not an important part of public safety. But we can't be letting violent criminals, drug dealers, sex offenders, all these things that are going on in our society run wild. And we're seeing this uptick mm. because police numbers have dropped, police act proactivity has dropped for a lot of different reasons. Uh, and we need to get back to going out there and doing our jobs. And that in turn will drive down crime. Yeah, that's awesome. So that's my three prong approach to that. Uh, get kind of long winded. And we, we asked, you asked about goals. Making sure body cameras are part of the every, everyday issue of the Windsor County Sheriff's Department. They're not now. This is a problem that should have been solved years ago. I didn't know that. Uh, it was always money, money, money. Listen, this, a check could have been written, body cameras could have been issued. That's kind of a day one thing for me to start that process. Making sure that cruiser cameras are all operational in every cruiser. They're not right now. Some do, some don't. Then, because everyone talks about in police work, transparency, right? Having the public kind of see behind the curtain, so to speak, and knowing that their public servants are doing the right thing. So the body-worn cameras, the cruiser cameras, having a, a media, a social media and web presence that connects you to your constituents, to the, to the folks that you serve. I mean, again, these are day one things. It's not going to be very hard, but will have a large impact. Um, Increasing training for our folks, right? I've, I've requested the records to look at their training, to look at salaries and these type of things. What I've seen is the bare minimum. Mm. And for me, the bare minimum is not good enough. So working on increasing training, there's a lot of different creative ways that we can do that without having to spend a bunch of money. But that's a conversation down the road. No, you just, you hit a lot of things that I have been thinking about and many people actually. Um, and hopefully I didn't put anybody right to sleep you. back home. No. You know, I mean, they, no. <laughs> you know, I try, try not to run my mouth for hours, but it just happens okay. sometimes. So I hope I didn't put anybody to sleep on that. That's okay. Grab a cup of coffee. You're good. But what's the most pressing issues facing the Windsor County Sheriff's Department? Well, I think the question is, better ask what's the most pressing issues facing Windsor County, right? Okay. And, and facing Windsor County is we are losing our friends, our family, our neighbors to drugs. Now, whether that's they're dying or they're just losing who they are mm -hmm. through substance abuse, right? Because substance abuse is never about one person. It affects Everybody. the entire family, oh, the, yeah. the, the social network around that person. So the drug epidemic. And again, I'm shifting that term from opioids to, to drugs as a whole because it's not just opioids anymore. No. Uh, and then this rise in crime that comes with the narcotics trade, mm -hmm. right? I mean... People have been shot and killed in Springfield. Springfield is our second largest town in Windsor County. The amount of violence crime that's going on down there 
is pretty significant. The police department there has gone through some serious staffing mm. issues, and the sheriff's department didn't do a lot to help out there. And I understand that there's funding issues and, and this, that, and the other thing, but as a countywide law enforcement agency, should have stepped up and said, hey, how can we help the people of Springfield? And the current administration let them kind of flounder. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that's, that's a big issue. And we're not just seeing crime in the larger towns. I mean, I hear people, I talk to people in places, you know, like Sharon, that say, hey, we can't get any help with issues. And there's a particular road and a particular house, and, and they haven't been able to get any help. And people are sick of it. So those are things that we need to tackle. There's all these things on the periphery too. I mean, people are driving crazier than I've ever seen in my life. And again, this goes back to proactivity, uh, being out there, being visible, being seen. Uh, I'm sick of losing our children so young to crime and drugs. And I think that goes back to, to us being mentors, which again, we're not gonna save every kid that's in trouble, but even if it's one out of 10 or one out of 20, that's better than sitting on our hands. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, drugs and crime are, are to me the biggest thing facing the county. What distinguishes you from the current sheriff, Michael Chamberlain? It's fresh ideas, fresh perspective. New, absolutely. Having a solid criminal justice law enforcement background, not just being a sheriff for 40 years. And again, no disrespect to Sheriff Chamberlain, they've built something from nothing, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's fiscally sound, it's done a great job, the department's in good health, they have good officers, but the mission, the ethos, whatever you wanna call it, needs to change, times are changing. We're in a position now where, again, look at the thefts, look at the violent crime, look at the deaths, look at the addiction issues. We need somebody with a fresh perspective that's gonna come in and tackle these crimes or tackle these issues using evidence-based policing, best practices, science, things that, that's not just winging it, but somebody who knows how to deal with these mm -hmm. things. And again, I've got a very strong law enforcement background. Um, I've put bad people in jail. I've worked with kids. I've done all these things that I'm not just up here saying things that I, that I no. can't accomplish. Uh, and, and that's the biggest difference to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also 36 years old. So there's still a lot of gas left in the tank and I'm ready to take this thing and give it my all uh, nice. until we can make some serious, serious changes. Nice. Do you have previous political experience? Well, as we touched on earlier, I am the chair of the Windsor Select Board. Right. This is my second term on the Windsor Select Board. Back when I was in 2000, I want to say eight, I was elected to uh, the Select Board. I was like 23 years old. So served a little while on there then. Uh, I'm a Justice of the Peace. I've been Justice of the Peace for, I don't know, three or four years now. Uh, really enjoy that. I think that's my second time being a JP. Uh, I ran for state rep years ago, but this is my, the biggest political campaign I've run. Um, and just to give people an idea of how much I've put into this, I sold a house. I sold a, house, a rental house that I owned just primarily to fund this. Uh, I'm about $36,000 into this race so far. Um, a good portion of that, close to $30,000 of that was my own money. Uh, I've raised a lot of money, so thank you for everybody that's donated to the campaign. Uh, it means a lot, and it's helped. <laughs> it's helped tremendously, especially in these last, you know, these, this last push at the end. But this is so important to me that um, I've basically put everything I have into this race because it means that much to me. It's from your heart. That's what I love. How can the sheriff's department have an impact on the opioid and drug problem in the, in our county? You've hit a lot of that, but yeah, and again, I just to reiterate, you. it's about being proactive. Mm -hmm. It's about taking steps forward, and not, you know, the sheriff touts, "Hey, we've been involved in drug take back day." Well, okay, it's a DA run program. 
and you're basically a taxi cab. You go and pick up the, the drugs from the different drop-off locations. Most of them are police departments. Not knocking that. That's great. But that's the only thing you've done. Right. And this has been a problem as long as I can remember. 20, at least 20 years or more, Vermont has been dealing with the influx of narcotics and crime, primarily from source cities like Holyoke, Springfield, Hartford, Connecticut, on yeah. the western side of the state, we're seeing Albany and New York City be yeah. major players. Even Boston, folks have come up from Boston at times. So being proactive, ticking these boxes off that I've, that I've already talked about, being involved with youth. You know, um, just recently an article in the White River Herald, which is up in the Randolph northern part of the county, the sheriff says he wants to be involved with at-risk youth. I've been saying this since February that we need to be more proactive with our young folks to change the trajectory of their lives. Uh, and where is the proactivity? And when I say proactivity, I don't just mean criminal interdiction, going out there, stopping cars, finding drugs, all these things, but getting out of your car. And there's some folks that work there that have done a tremendous job mm -hmm. of getting out of your car, interacting with people, yep. having conversations, eating breakfast at the local diner, you know, stopping and grabbing coffee. Uh, although I appreciate the sentiment of coffee with a cop programs, coffee with a cop should be every day in your jurisdiction because you're out there interacting with people, having organic conversations mm -hmm. where people feel comfortable coming to you. I can't tell you how many times people reach out to me, whether it's, you know, text message, phone call, social media, whatever, reach out to me with questions, concerns, information. One of the biggest things about narcotics investigations in particular is we need information, right? We can't stop these crimes without people helping us. Mm -hmm. So if you build strong, positive relationships within your community. Trust. Yep. Trust. Don't get me wrong. Not everybody loves me. Well, but I, I think I've done an overall pretty good job yeah, of connecting to the communities that I've served along the way. Yep. So going out there building those relationships, it pays dividends exponentially when you're looking to solve criminal cases. I just had a case in Ludlow, I won't get into it, but because of the, the relationships that I've made, knowing my community, having people go, oh yeah, here's the answer to your question, knowing where certain people were, we were able to solve something that was fairly serious in a very short amount of time because of the network and relationships that I built Trust. here in town. Yep. And again, you keep bringing up this word trust. We Huge. should trust our police. We Huge. should not be an occupying force sitting on the side of Route 5, stopping everybody and their brother that's going skiing, right? Right. And don't get me wrong. Again, I'm not saying that we're not going to write tickets and we're not going to stop cars. But what is the focus? What is the mission? What is the ethos of your agency? And it should be making the world a better place, mm -hmm. not generating revenue to enrich yourself and your family. And we can get into that. But um, I think you know where I stand in that scenario. Yes. How will you handle the increasing mental health and substance abuse calls? Sure. And circling back, which I can't believe I just used that term, but <laughs> having an onboard in-house social worker, yep. right? That's step number one. Step number two is, again, we talk about proactivity, training your officers to better handle these situations. One yeah. of the best courses I ever went to was the FBI Crisis Negotiator School. And the second best probably was Silver State Consulting's de-escalation training. But I went for a week at the Vermont Police Academy. It was taught by FBI Crisis Negotiators. It used to be called Hostage Negotiators, but it's, it encompasses much more than that. But FBI Crisis Negotiators, and we spent a week up there learning how to be a negotiator, how to talk to people mm -hmm. in crisis. Yeah. One, of the big, one of the biggest things I learned in that class is that Rational thought and extreme emotions mm -hmm. cannot coexist, right? They're a teeter-totter. They cannot coexist. They never balance out. So understanding that principle alone has made me a better patrol officer, a better detective, a better human being interacting mm -hmm. with my own friends and family and my personal relationships. So training our officers. And, and everyone says, money, 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 money. I understand that. This, this training... Uh, was the FBI Department of Justice put on, cost me $60 to go for a week. 
now obviously my salary had to be paid but i was i was going to put in vacation for it that's how important it was for me when you host training when it's for profit training when you host that the host agency usually gets free seats so there's so many different ways that we can do better job at training whether it's using federal uh, resources like the fbi crisis negotiator school whether it's bringing in training from out of state or, or wherever uh, in hosting that training and then your department gets free seats. Or if it's just having in-house trainers, train the trainer as a force multiplier, right? You send somebody to a training class. Again, I've been through multiple, I'm a, a firearms instructor, uh, active shooter response instructor, many things like that. I'm a field training officer. So I teach young officers on the, you know, new officers on the job and mentor them. So there's so many ways that we can increase training without having to spend a lot of money. Right. And that's always the issue or the complaint because, oh, we don't have the money. Well, let's get creative then. So that's a, that's a big, I mean, that is the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. You have to have better trained police officers who have to have understanding and empathy and the qualifications to deal with folks in crisis. And I'll actually address that after because, um, I had a personal situation and actually reached out to Ryan and the way he handled it uh, was a huge impact on this person's life and has brought it up since then. So that's huge and yeah. I appreciate. Thank you. What is your position on the political environment directed at defund the police? Well, I'm a career law enforcement officer. I've been around it since I was 16 years old. So it's pretty obvious that I knew this was going to be a bad thing from the start. It has not worked anywhere that's been been implemented, right? This idea that you're going to take away money from the police and all, all of a sudden things are going to be better. And I get that there's this, oh, no, we're taking money away and we're putting it elsewhere. American policing is very expensive. There's a multitude of reasons for that that we don't have time to get into. But at the end of the day, American policing is very expensive. So... The answer is never going to be take away funding from the police. Right. Now, there can be accountability issues <laughs> that need to be brought up. There can be training issues. There can be staffing things. Uh, there can be doctrine issues. Those should be addressed. And I don't always think you can legislate your way out of that, but it's about putting leaders in, in the positions to make those changes and to lead from the front, right? So we have seen where it's been a complete failure in Burlington. We see it's been a complete failure in the Pacific Northwest where it was a big, big movement. Yep. Um, in other major metropolitan cities, New York City, complete failure. We need to support our police, but that doesn't give us carte blanche to say, we're the cops, we'll do what we want. There has been some very important and significant issues that have been brought up through this movement. Um, there's a lot of things that we as a profession need to evolve so the term police reform i don't call it reform i call it evolution evolving our career field and there's some things that we've had to take some real hard looks at ourselves and go okay how can we do this better because there there was some very serious uh, and legitimate complaints throughout this defund movement um, and i think a lot of things here i'm trying to address mm -hmm. right training how you interact with the public things, accountability things like body-worn cameras, cruiser cameras, you know, proper internal affairs complaint adjudication, whatever that might be. Um, during the primary, Tom Batista, who's a, a current deputy there, had brought up civilian oversight committees. Now, we, we differed a little bit in our opinion on that, but the more I've, I've put thought into it, the more research I've done, uh, I plan on standing up what I'm going to call the Sheriff's Advisory Council, which will have representatives from probably each of the towns that we provide contractual service for, maybe through the whole county. I think we need to work you know, through the logistics of that, but have them appointed by probably the town select board. I think that makes the most sense than the sheriff's out of it. I'm not picking people. But have an advisory council that is the conduit to their towns that gives direct feedback, right? Because somebody who's a resident of a town or village is going to have even more knowledge than even me who doesn't live right. there doing yep. the best I can to, to, you know, connect with the community. 
So I think that will be important. Um, but defund is not going to work. Do I think that the sheriff's contracts to really achieve the goals that we're trying to achieve may cost a little bit more? I do. And that's just being kind of transparent and honest. I think mm -hmm. that if towns could pay a little bit more, I think we're we're very close to a position where we could provide maybe not 24-hour service, but 24-hour response at least um, to make up for this void in state police that are about 50% manning. And I, I think that they want to get out of the small town policing business anyways. So I think this a countywide law enforcement agency, a regional police force is the answer for some of our small towns. And I think there's been this dynamic shift in the population in Vermont, where a lot of people have come from out of state, where there is most of these urban areas that folks are coming from, they have modern professional law enforcement service that's a phone call away. And I think people will be willing to pay a little bit more to have that service so that they feel safe and secure in their homes. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's what we're looking to do. And I'm not saying that this needs to be all completely funded on the taxpayers' backs. I think there's a lot of different creative oh, funding absolutely. solutions out there, yep. uh, mm -hmm. especially revolving around grants. But, yep. but we'll, mm -hmm. you know, that's, again, it's a whole other discussion. Right. Last question. Why should voters cast their ballot for you? Sure. If you follow this campaign at all, I think you've seen the effort that I've put in. I think my policies appeal to both sides of the aisle. I care and I want to make impactful change that's going to make Windsor County a better place. So I don't know there's a whole lot more that I can say about that, but I care, I'm qualified, I'm competent, and I want to do this job for the right reasons. And I promise you, if you vote for me, I will make you proud. And that's, that's it, Paul. I mean, that's at the end of the day, yeah. that's what I think it boils down to. Do you want, you're either voting for change or you're voting for the same old, same old. And if you're happy with your county law enforcement being a revenue generator for the sole purpose of generating revenue to pay for county law enforcement, then I'm not your candidate. But if you're looking for somebody to come in and make positive changes and try to tackle these problems that have been uh, an epidemic in our communities, then I think I'm your candidate. I think you are too. In fact, I know you are. Um, I just know personally during um, the impact during a crisis, you actually de-escalated a situation um, just by treating um, a person as a human being and just making sure they were okay, not coming off as anything but just a person that cares, and that's huge. Um, so get out there and vote because it is time for a change, a huge change. And I welcome Ryan, and I know several people actually with your last interview reached out to me and they said, wow, I had no idea all that about him, and you're amazing, and I wish you luck. I think you're going to be amazing and uh, thank you. Rock it. Thank, thank you, you, Ryan. Appreciate it. Thank you. Have a wonderful day and I look forward to seeing you next time. And please, again, get out there and vote. And Ryan, if you have any ending remarks or anything or. Again, I'll just leave it with this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We've had significant success in the primary. The amount of support that I've received has been overwhelming. This has not been an easy process, putting no, yourself out there, both, uh, you know, the amount of physical work that's yeah. gone into it, the amount of emotional stuff that's gone into it. And just from a monetary standpoint, this has been uh, a huge part of my life over the last six or eight months. Yeah. And I'm so thankful for the love and support that I've gotten from the community. And uh, I'm going to do everything I can to be successful in this position. You'll be amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.